Does it say always stay start at zero or one? That's what I thought. So we really, really should start at zero, especially if the book tells us to. But for this one, what did it say here? Does it say that right here? Give the starting value of the index, n or k, for example. So I, I guess you could start with anything, but let's start at zero unless you absolutely find a reason not to, and I still have it yet to find that. So in this one, what's the first thing somebody noticed for this? If Let's start at zero, and we'll go to infinity. They like to use k sometimes. Does it functionally matter which one you use? The only reason sometimes I use k is it looks better than n and u because my u's and my n's look the same. So it looks like something's going on. What do I do? Is it n plus 2 to begin with? So that takes care of this right here, right? Correct? 2, 3, 4. But it looks like there's some missing denominators here, right? 1 factorial and... So we know it's going to be over what? n factorial, sorry, not 0 factorial. Um, you notice how we have an infinitely malleable surface right here? Make sure you use space. Like, you should not be trying to cram your work in. We are, we, that was the you know the first thing we tried to get Matt not to do. Okay, so we got we've taken care of a bunch of this so far. So that takes care of the bottoms, right? Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, someone. Okay, hold on. Let's go to this. Um, there's an x plus five in there, right? But what's the last thing we need to figure out? The exponent. So when n is zero. What was that exponent? Three. three. And when n is one, what is it? And then when it's two, what is it? And then three, it's nine. So how do we? F what's the relationship? Come on, this is a linear relationship. When it's four, what's the next one going to be? Eleven. Can someone tell me how? What's the rule for translating these two? Thank you very much. Bingo. Who said that? Good job. Two n plus three, and you are all done. There you go. Now you have the explicitly defined expression. Good. Use the ratio test to find what? The radius of convergence? Yeah. Just the radius. Okay. So what limit are we doing here? We're doing the limit as n goes to infinity of at a n plus 1 over a n, right? I'm just going to do two steps at one here, uh, at once here. So it's going to be x minus 3 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 times 2 to the that's the nth plus one term, do you agree? And then instead of writing the fraction and then flipping it, I'm just going to flip the original. So it's going to be n 2 to the n over what? x minus 3 to the n. This one started at 1. This one started at 1? Oh, it did. Congratulations. Nice. So we now need to simplify. <laughs> we now need to simplify. So can we simplify here? Yes, this is going to be x minus 3 on top because that gets rid of these two, right? Because n plus 1 minus n is 1 right there. That's the power power right there. Yay, we got rid of those. And now, when we do the subtraction here, there's, uh, you have an n plus 1 here still, and an n, right? But then this goes away, leaving you with just what on the denominator? 2. So do you agree with this? Did we account for everything there? Yes? Did we? We did? Come on, have a stand here. Remember, this is not American democracy. This is like, take a stand and have a voice. Yes. Is this okay? Speak so that humans can hear. There we go! We took five times. <laughs> okay, so now we n is going to infinity. So what do we know? What, what happens here with these? What's n over n plus 1 as n goes to infinity? 1 x is the fixed value, so what is this going to equal? The absolute value of what? Over 2. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that match? I think, I think that's right. I'm pretty confident with it, right? So at this point, for this to converge, for this to converge, that value has to be less than 1. So you're going to write this, x minus 3 over 2 less than 1. So therefore, x minus 3 over 2 is between 1 and negative 1, so we end up with negative 2, 3, and 2, so x is between 5 and 1. So what's the radius of convergence going to be? 2. That's from the center value of 3. 3 goes up 2 to 5 and down 2 to 1. The radius is 2. Cool.
the radius of the interval. So this is the interval right here, correct? The radius is based around the center, which is 3. What is this distance right here? 2 and 2. 2 on each side, so 2. The radius. The thing is, uh, this kind of goes back to Algebra 2 when I show kids polynomials for the first time and they freak out, right? But they see linear equations. What are linear equations? Polynomials. Like every function they've ever seen is a polynomial. They just haven't called it a polynomial. So great, you, all polynomials are going to be infinite geometric series. It's kind of cool. Other questions. Okay, so first step would be find the general term. It's kind of cool. You have to be real careful with it, don't you? So again, zero. let's go from n equals 0 to infinity. I like that. So what did we do? We, we, we like regeneralized the first terms right there. So what do we think the, the, the regeneralization of the first terms are going to be? Looks like what? 2 factorial x to the first over what? 1 factorial squared. Is that correct? Does that kind of make, do you see what I did there? This term and this term and this term all, all are like basically the same format, right? So what did I do to the 2x? I turned it into the general form. Is that the same thing? Yeah, 1 factorial is 1, 1 squared is 1, it's over 1, it doesn't change anything. So what would this regeneralization be? That looks like it's 1 factorial x to the 0 over what? 0 factorial squared. That's a fancy way to write the number 1. Why did I regeneralize the first two terms? What's the point? Why? It's easier to see a pattern, right? Similarly, when you see fractions that have been reduced and you're trying to figure out if it's a geometric series, unreduce them so you can actually see the chain of numbers. That can really trip, trips me up all the time. So now when we look at this, is it a little bit easier to write this out in general? I, I think so. So what goes down on the bottom? It looks like it's going to be n factorial what? Squared. And then it's going to be maybe n plus 1 factorial x to the what? To the n. In my opinion, it's a lot easier to see that once you look at the chain, because this is going 1, then 2, then 1, then 2. Oh, wait, no. Yeah, it, doesn't work. it doesn't work. Look, it's 1, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 0 factorial. Oh, so instead of saying 1 factorial, what do we need to call it? So we're oh, close. So it's actually 0 factorial, right? So it's 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. So what is it going to be? 2n factorial. Good. Is that better? Ah. So what's the what do you think the biggest thing you have to make sure you remember to do when you're running a ratio test on this one? Exactly. It's not two n plus one. You have to plug in n plus one for n. So wherever you see n, you see wherever you see n right here? So I'll 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 rewrite it like this. So what is the nth plus 1 term, what is that going to be? 2 times n plus 1 factorial, right? x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial squared. You have to be super careful, super, super careful. And to continue with this, this these are your new n's, right? Yeah. I guess if you have trouble forgetting, before you substitute, put parentheses around all your ends. Just go in and put parentheses around all of them, and it'll help you remember. I think you did. Okay, so 22 is right there. So 22 is right there, and I don't know what just happened here. Let's figure that out. There we go. Came back. 22. Go right ahead. When you find the radius of convergence, you find it. What is the radius on this thing? What's the radius of convergence? Yeah. So it's 1, right? Yeah, it is. You're describing very well. I just did what you don't like. I don't like you doing to me. It's good, you know. The interval of convergence. What is the, does it ask you for the interval of convergence? No. No, it doesn't ask us for it. It just determine the radius. It is 1. What does this tell us about the interval of convergence of this series? So the interval has a width of 2. That's all it tells you. It tells you the, the interval has a width of 2. We haven't determined where it is. If you're just, the, the radius itself could be 1, but that radius could be centered anywhere on the number line, right? Like we can move it anywhere we want. 
B, investigate convergence at the endpoints. That's the key here. You have to test your endpoints, test your endpoints, test your endpoints. What did you find when you tested your endpoints? What did you find? So I, my guess is you ended up with this, right? So you ended up with this, but you weren't sure if the endpoint should be included or not. What did you find out? I see some good stuff over there. Seems pretty good over there. Seems good right there. Purple, do I see it right there? I can't tell if it includes the endpoints in the purple over there. Yeah, it does. It does include both of them? No, 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 no it doesn't. It, doesn't. it shouldn't it include. include right, but that, I can't tell where you explicitly stated that. Maybe you didn't get there. Yeah, what you find out, do you include one? Yes. Do you include negative one? No, because when you plug in negative one, what do you end up with? The opposite of the harmonic, which is just negative one times the harmonic. Can multiplying by a constant change the convergence of a series? No, it can't. Good job, everybody. What is that? You've seen that so many freaking times. What is that? Yeah. There's a derivative in it, but what what is that? You you've used that before. That is a linear equation. Very good. That is a linear equation. That literally is y equals mx plus b, right? But specifically, that little squiggly equal sign, that doesn't mean equal. What does that mean? Yeah. Equivalent to. So the associated picture is this one right here. What you've just looked at is the equation for a tangent line at an x value of a. You have done that so many different times in your life. So many different times, right? Uh, tangent lines. The idea here is that for values close to a, this tangent line is a pretty good approximation of this curve. That's a relative term. Close is relative, right? But at this view, at this resolution, it looks like this tangent line right here, the tangent line right here, maybe it's a good estimate from here to here. But what happens as you get further from A? It gets less accurate. It gets less accurate. So this is a linear approximation. Do you remember using linear approximations on the AP test? You had the, that was an AP topic, linear approximations. You would use the linear approximation to find the estimate of a function, right? Because like... I could go to this x value, like x plus a certain, let's say, q value, and then go up here. Here's the actual output. Here's your estimate. Which one's easier to find? The estimate is easier to find because working with a line is generally easier than some curvy function. Like, it's kind of really developed in last semester, right? Here's the thing, though. Do approximations have to be linear? Oh, no. No, they don't. They don't have to be linear. Here's the thing. Do we potentially have functions out there in the world that are like weird and crazy and curvy and weird? Yes. We like linear functions because it's a single degree. Well, what degree could you raise your approximation to? Instead of the line of ah, instead of the line of best fit, you could have the what's one degree higher than one? We can have the what's a better way to say problem? Yeah, so instead of the line of best fit, we could have the quadratic of best fit. We could have the cubic of best fit, right? Here's the thing. This line is accurate only for a certain neighborhood. It's actually not a good thing to use neighborhood. I'm not like making that up. Why would we ever want to have a quadratic of best fit? Exactly. It might be accurate for a larger neighborhood, right? Why would we ever want a cubic of best fit? It might be more accurate for even larger amount. Why would we need, what about a fourth degree, or a fifth degree, or a sixth degree? We're going to be using power series to write approximations of functions. Remember what I told you, what was the overall reason for us using power series? The overall reason for us using power series is we're going to have functions that we want to do things with, but we have no idea how to do anything with them. But we can write them as power series that look ugly, but what can we do with the power series? All the things we didn't know how to do to this thing. And then we'll put it back together and get a conclusion about this. We'll turn A into B, work on B, get a result that also applies to A. Do you understand the general idea of what we're doing here? So what we need to do is we need to do a specific example, and then we need to generalize. The generalization is usually the thing that's hardest to understand. That's why it's sometimes counterintuitive to look at the blue boxes first, because the blue boxes are like everything pressed into like the super efficient easy way of writing it down, but it sometimes isn't a good place to start. So instead, what we do is we look at what this is called, and then we do an example. Taylor polynomial of degree 1 approximating f of x for x near 0. 
What the heck? Taylor polynomial of degree one. Well, why is it degree one? It's a, it's a line, right? It's a line. What does f prime of zero mean? That's just the slope of the tangent line at x equals one, right? And this is the initial, this is x equals zero, sorry, at, at x equals zero, at x equals zero. And then f of zero is the actual function output at zero. You've done this before. You've done this before many, many times. This is just the tangent line at zero. That's it. But here's the thing. What did I say we're heading towards? We're not going to use lines anymore. What are we going to use? Higher degree polynomials is a line. I literally said that a couple of earlier this class. Is a line a polynomial? Yes. We're going to be using higher degree polynomials to estimate, to rewrite functions, to give us approximations. Not the linear approximation, the quadratic approximation. And here's the rule we're going to use for our first one. So we're going to find the quadratic approximation of g of x equals cosine x for x near 0. And everybody in their head visualize what cosine looks like? The curvy thing, right? So are you pretty much okay believing that maybe there is a quadratic that, that mimics pretty well the curvature of cosine? Like, is cosine quadratic? No. But is it pretty close? It is pretty close, around 0, right? So here's the rule we're going to work with here. To ensure that the quadratic is a good approximation, we require that the cosine and the quadratic have the same value, the same slope, and the same second derivative of that zero. So what we're going to say is, here's cosine, right? At cosine zero, we're looking for a quadratic that has the same function value, the same first derivative, and the same second derivative. You with me so far? So what does this look like? Rephrase. What's cosine of zero? One. So it looks like this, right? It goes down like this, and then what is it? It goes back up, right? On both sides? So we're looking for a quadratic that actually passes through this point right here. Is that quadratic going to point up or down? It's going to go down. The quadratic is going to go like this. The idea is that that quadratic is a better approximation of cosine for a larger neighborhood. So do you see the overall goal? So the first thing we know is that this quadratic has to go through that point. The first derivative has to be the same as cosine at that point, and the second derivative has to be the same. You with me so far? So if our function g of x is cosine x, what is g prime of x? Negative sine of x, thank you. And what's our second derivative? Negative cosine of x. So what is, first of all, what's g of 0? Well, we know that's 1. I already asked you that. What's g prime of 1? Well, that's going to be negative sine of, so not 1, <laughs> 0, excuse me. I can't copy things correctly, apparently. g prime of 0, and this is 0 right here. What's ne Well, what is sine of 0? So what's negative sine of zero? Zero. What's g double prime of zero? That's going to be negative cosine of zero. Well, what's cosine of zero? So this is what? Negative one, right. We're looking for a quadratic of best fit. You with me so far? What's the general form for a quadratic? We'll call, uh, let's call it a of x, our approximation. a of x is going to be, let's say, uh, well, uh, we don't need to use a because I want to use something. Let's call it g of it, uh, uh, h of x. That's our approximation. This is our approximation. What degree are we looking for this polynomial to have? Second. So I'm just going to make up some values here. Do we know the coefficients? No. We need to find three coefficients. ax squared plus what? Plus c. Well, what's h prime of x equal to? Plus 2ax, sorry, excuse me. 2ax, and I can't, I'm, I know, I know, I'm deleting the wrong stuff. Plus b, and what's h double prime supposed to be equal to? Just 2a, right? Correct? Are you with me so far? Because a, b, and c are constants. Our goal is, our whole goal for this is to find a, b, and c. That's what we're looking for. You with me so far? Well, we know that these three things at 0 have to be equal to 1, 0, and 
negative one. So what is, oh, sorry, what is, so let's just comma, what is h of zero going to be equal to? C. What about h prime of zero? What's that equal to? B. And h double prime of zero? What's that equal to? No, 2a. There's no x in it. There's no x in it. Be careful. Oh, but we, they need to be the same. So what does c equal? What does b equal? Zero. And what does 2a have to equal? Negative one. Do you see where those are coming from, everybody? It's really important that you see this. So we have one going to there. We have zero going to there. And we have our negative one going to here. So what do we end up with? Well, we actually have our polynomial. H of x is therefore equal to what? Ah, negative one half x squared plus zero x plus what? One. We just found our coefficients. Do you see why a is negative a half? Divide by two on both sides. It's clear, right? <laughs> Not always. So what does this actually look like? Let's just. It's going to be negative what? 0.5x squared, right? Plus 1. So I'll do zoom trig. I kind of like zoom trig. So what's it graphing there? Cosine. Cosine. So if we did this properly, where should the other function cross through? 0, 1. Oh, look at that. Is that a pretty cool estimate right there? Yeah, that's a really good estimate right there. So we take this, and you can actually come up with comparisons of the accuracy. So like, if you want to know what the comparison of the accuracy is, you can go in and you can kind of like, what's the distance from here to here, or from here to here? It's accurate for a longer period of time, because our person, our, if we did a linear approximation, what's the linear approximation at cosine zero? What's the linear, what is it? it what is it? Correct, it's just this. That's only accurate really, 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 really close. Is that red one accurate even more? Sure. Now, if we wanted to make this even more accurate, meaning have it follow the curves, we need to keep on raising the degree of the polynomial, correct? Mike, I'll translate that. Could we, using the same exact work with just a, a couple more lines, come up with the cubic of best fit? Could we come up with the quartic of best fit? Yeah, we could. For cosine, because it's infinitely oscillating, what kind of function actually will be the most accurate for us? How long do we want it to be? Exactly. How many turning points does cosine have? <laughs> Good answer, all of them. It ha no, it has an infinite number of turning points, right? So if we want, it, what degree polynomial do we need to accurately model cosine? Yeah, an infinitely, an infinitely degree polynomial, polynomial of infinite degree. Is there a power series for cosine? Yes. Is there a power series for sine? Yes. If you have a power series for sine and cosine, therefore, what do you have a power series for? Tangent, cosecant, secant, inverse cotangent, right? Because the relationships are the same. Are you with me so far? Welcome to things you have to memorize for the BC calculus exam. We haven't gotten to writing them yet. They're not that bad. Please believe me. They're these formulas working with right here, these are way more complicated. Sine, cosine come out to be really nice. So let's keep moving. So do you understand the overall generalization? So this is the Paler polynomial of degree two. So it's degree two, because it's going to square, approximating f of x for x near zero. The reason it is x near zero is theoretically could we have moved that approximation for cosine over on pi over zero over pi? We could have centered it somewhere else, right? Paler polynomials are really nice because we can center them around. We like centering them around. Like when given the choice, center them around zero for things you have to be nicer. Are you always going to be centered around zero? Please. No, you're not always going to be. This is the generalization of what we just did. This is the generalization of what we just did. This was our constant c. Our constant came out to be the function evaluated at zero, right? This right here is the coefficient of x. The coefficient of x turns out to be f prime of zero. But what is f prime of zero for cosine? It was zero, right? So we didn't have an x term in our polar polynomial that we do. Oh, f double prime of zero was negative one, right? So what was our coefficient? Negative one over two. Where did that two come from? Two was bringing down the power of x when we did the derivative. This is the generalization of what we just did. 
f of 0, f prime of 0, x, f prime of 0, x squared. Oh, do you sense that this could keep on going? Do you sense that it could keep on going? Uh, you have intuition about it. Oh, could, so could we do the same thing with a cubic if we wanted to? Do you really want me to do that algebra? Just say no. What? No, not necessarily. That's it. Do you understand what Nate just asked? Nate just asked. Sorry, Nate just asked. Well, don't we just need to? Aren't the first three values even necessary? Are going to be the same? Not necessarily. Uh, no, excuse me. No, 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 no. You're right. It would just be one more. You're absolutely wrong. I'm sorry. They would be the same because the formula just keeps going. You're right. The first, the first two are the same. Right. Okay. Because if you took this away right here, what are you left with right here? That's the Taylor polynomial of degree one. You're absolutely right. Good catch. So what does the general formula look like? This is what you need to remember right here. If you remember one thing from today, this is what you remember right here. That right there is the coefficient of x to the n in the Taylor polynomial. There it is. Does this mean f raised to the n power? What does that mean? N derivative, exactly. In parentheses, this means n derivative. Okay. So the coefficient you need of x to the n is always going to be the n derivative that evaluated at zero over n factorial. The reason that n factorial comes in, if you have something to the fourth power and you keep on taking the derivative, what's the first derivative? You bring down four. But then what's the oh it's three, you bring that down. And then you bring down the two. So factorial comes from the fact that you're going to be repeatedly taking the derivative. The reason I'm handling you through this is you never need to build a Taylor polynomial with the algebra that I just gave you. More than just a part of that. Because if I ask you to do a cubic, it comes down to systems of equations and stuff three. It's really annoying algebra. I'm not teaching algebra. You know how to do algebra. You get to use this. So this is the crux to Taylor polynomial right here. This is the whole thing. With this, you can write any Taylor polynomial you want. So what does the general form? Construct the Taylor polynomial of degree 7 approximating the function sine x near 0. Compare the value of the Taylor approximation for the true value of f at x equals pi over 3. So what we first need to do is this. You're going to do this a bunch. You're going to do this on the AP test. You're going to do this in this class. You're going to do this a bunch. First of all, we know f of x is equal to sine x. So what's our first derivative of x equal to? Cosine x. What about our second derivative? What's that equal to? Negative sine x. What about f triple prime of x? What is it? Negative cosine x. What f4? What's that equal to? Sine x. f5. What's of x? What's that equal to? Cosine x. Is it going to start repeating? So what's that equal to? And f7, please don't be writing this down. This is exactly the type of thing you should not write down in this class. Why did I stop there? Yeah, construct the Taylor polynomial of degree 7, right? The seventh term of degree 7 means we have to go to x to the 7. We need the seventh derivative. So now we need to evaluate each of these at what? At what? Zero. So in this case, help me with this, what's f of 0 going to be? 0. f prime of 0? 1. F, f double prime of 0? Is it negative 1? Oh, just 0, right? Is that correct? What about f triple prime of 0? So f, that's three, four. what about f4? It's what? f5? 1 f6 and f7. So let's look at what this says. This formula, do you, can you read all of that? Is that too small? Can you kind of see what I wrote there? So first of all, our Taylor polynomial leads off with f of 0. So what is f of 0 going to be? 0. And then we have f prime of 0 x, but what is f prime of 0? So we have plus 1x. I'm going to write it in like this just so you can see. A lot of these terms are going to go away because we have zeros, right? Our next term is f double prime of 0 over 2 factorial 
x squared. What is f double prime of 0? Zero? 0. So this goes away and that turns into what? It turns into 0. Does this whole thing end up going away? Yeah, I'm going to leave it there because remember, the blanks help set a pattern. What's our next term going to be? It's going to be f triple prime of 0, right, over what factorial? 3 factorial x to the third. Well, what's f triple prime? So we end up with, instead of f triple prime, we end up with negative 1. What's the next one going to be? f4 of 0 over what? Oh, look, does this become pretty repetitive? So now we need to read the table. What's f4? What is it? 0. So what happens to this? Becomes 0. Oh, what's the next one going to become? It's the fifth one. What's the fifth one? 1 over 5 factorial x to the fifth. 0 over 6 factorial x to the sixth. What's our seventh one going to be? Negative, right? Negative 1 over 7 factorial x to the seventh. So I wrote them all out so you could see what happens. Do a lot of those terms go away? What's the first term that sticks around? x minus 1 over 3 factorial x to the cube. So another way to write that would be just this. And then what? Plus over minus That right there is a really good estimate for which function. Sine, right? This is a great estimate for sine around zero. It's going to bend a bunch of times. It's going to follow it for a while. Now, here's the thing. I wrote it in summarized form like this. Can you predict what the next term is going to be? What do you think the next one's going to be? Plus x to the ninth over... So what's the super awesome infinite Taylor series, Taylor polynomial that estimates cosine everywhere? 9, and then it's to the 11 over 11 factorial. Look, minus, plus, minus, plus. Are these patterns you have to memorize? Yeah. Yeah, you are. Okay. We'll pause here.